I saved the craziest, most controversial, tough talk for last. Tell somebody it's about to get cray cray. Tell somebody, but Ben loves Jesus. Just want to say it. Ben loves Jesus. So uh, a pastor a while back, a long time ago actually, I really can't say a while back much anymore. Ain't that crazy? Pastor once told me, he said, I hadn't said a cuss word since 1951 when I got saved. And they, you know, they put the emphasis on saved. Glory to God. And uh, number one, I didn't believe him. And I won't believe you if you tell me that. Uh, um, but even if it was true, my response in my heart, I'm not this rude unless you cross me. Um, like in my heart, I wanted to say cookies. Because you, you may not cuss, but I've seen you talk down to your wife. I've seen you be a demanding, prideful leader that thinks your truth is the truth. And anybody who challenges your truth, it, it doesn't work out well for them. We have missed the entire point. See, we've made some things surface. And I'm going to be talking about this a lot for the rest of the year. We make things surface so that we don't have to do something with them. And see, what happens is when you, you are cursing, when you start a conversation with, I probably shouldn't say this, but. Or I know this is gossiping, but. Or church people are really good at making it pretty. You know, we probably ought to, I just, I can't share details, but we should pray for brother and sister so-and-so and their family. You know, you betray their confidence and you curse without giving a detail because they confided in you and trusted you with discretion. That is cursing. That is cursing. That is cursing. When you allow people to speak into your life who undervalue and underappreciate you and you give them the type of space that they shouldn't have, that is cursing. When you undermine the value of God in anybody or yourself, that tells somebody that's cursing. This message is not about cussing. This was all just to get you in here. Not really to get you in here. I just know that that's what most people think when they think cursing. This message is not about cursing. It's about cuss. It's not about cussing. It's about cursing. If you, I'm a jumpy person, y'all. I am literally a jumpy person. If you try to record me and jump out and scare me, you will have an incriminating video. If you throw a frog on me or act like you're throwing a frog on me, you're, the words, my words won't be the ugliest thing coming at you. I don't know what will fly at you. Do it at your own risk. Long story. Don't want to go into it. It's traumatic. Cursing is, cursing is so much more. And this message is not on cussing. It is on cursing because we do it all the time. All the time. Matter of fact, before we get started, we're going to keep this thing 100. Find two people near you and say this. Say, I curse too much. much. Say it one more time. I said two. I said two. I curse too much. much. Every one of us, we curse too much. We curse all the time. We don't even know we're cursing. And before I put my point out there, don't put it up yet, baby. Don't put it up. I want to ask y'all, are y'all ready for this? Are y'all ready? Because I promise you, this one, this one right here, I've even been nervous about it in the week. And I've had to check my own motives for keeping stuff out, and I decided not to. You ready for it? Here it is. Your words, your words define your life and diagnose your heart. Your words define your life and diagnose your heart. Lord, right now, I could preach on this all day. As a matter of fact, it's taken me a long time to get it this short. And I ask you to speak through me clearly, quickly, effectively, because I know that we got people that are going to be ready for lunch at some time. Lord, pour your heart out, out of me and give it to people in a challenging way, but not a cocky way. In Jesus' name, amen. I don't want my words to just sound good. You can put an air freshener on a turd, but you can also flush it down the toilet. I don't. I am not preaching on a cold today. See, we like to, I get told, oh, why don't you preach on this? Because I don't preach on colds, I preach on cancer. And I am not preaching on colds today because the cancer in your life are the things that are, that, are, that are holding you out and cutting you off from what God wants to do in your life. The life that Jesus himself said he promised to give you. That he came to give you. Cussing and cursing are two different things, and I shouldn't even have to give this disclaimer, but in the world we are living in, I'm going to, so that there's a record of it. This message is not about cussing. I am not discouraging you or encourage, excuse me, I'm not encouraging you to cuss. I am discouraging and begging you to stop cursing because it will cost you. 
It is costing you. It is costing you. Tell somebody right now, say you curse too much. You curse too much. You, every one of us, I, I'm raising my hand right now online, drop a comment, tell somebody that you're watching it with, say, say I curse too much because every one of us, you got to keep it 100. We curse way too much. And we, we want to talk about, man, we try to make it look pretty. I don't cuss. I go, don't go to church. You curse all the time. Every one of us do. Tell somebody one more time, say you curse too much. And your words will define your life, but they also diagnose your heart. If you want to do something with them, do something and change your life, look at your words. Man, Jesus wasn't afraid of it. I'm going to jump into this thing because i got a lot of scripture to cover. And I promise I'm trying to do it quickly. I, I should be able to. I want to start in Luke chapter 6. He wasn't afraid of the tough talks or the tough principles. He didn't hide from it. We're the ones that hide from it. Luke chapter 6. Here we go. Jesus starts this thing out. A good person produces good things from the treasury, the overflow, what fills your life, of a good heart. An evil person produces evil things from the treasury, an overflow, what fills your life of an evil heart? Here it is. Say that with me. What you say flows from what is in your heart. Here's the thing. You are never going to be able to make up your mind to quit flipping out and acting a fool and making a fool of yourself. Ever. You are never going to be able to just make up your mind to stop being bitter. To stop acting foolish and repeating bad patterns and going back to bad relationships. It's not how it works. I had a, years ago I had a husband come up to me and he was like, man just pray for me. I just, I just want, I just want to pray that I can make up my mind to quit cussing out my wife and everybody. Everybody just pisses me off and makes me angry. And, and I literally told him, I said, man that's just not how it works. You can't make up your mind to stop doing that stuff. What's in you comes out. Jesus said, what is in you flows, what comes out of you flows from what is in your mouth. What's in you comes out. You were never, you know, I told him, I said, you want to change your life, change what's inside of you. See, your words will not only define your life, they diagnose your heart. And if you want to see where your heart is and where it needs to grow, I have to look at myself in the mirror every single day and I really try to take honest looks. Your, your words define, will diagnose your heart if you want them to. They will, always. And I'm telling you, it starts, you want to change what's inside of you? It starts right here. Tell somebody, get your mouth right. Talk about get your mind right. We'll start with your mouth. Start talking right first. Get your mouth right. Man, it, it, it starts right here. King Solomon said, life and death are in the power of the tongue, and those who love it will eat its fruits. The words you speak are either poison that you're eating, but the poison that's inside of you are promise. It's up to you. But it starts right here. King Solomon stopped practicing that at the end of his life, and it, his life fell apart. Israel paid for it for centuries. Because life and death starts in your tongue. Starts in your tongue. And your words define your life and diagnose your heart. So if you want to do something with it, you can't tell somebody he's just, Ben's just getting started. Just getting started. I'm telling you, I'm just getting started. Luke chapter 9. Uh, uh, Jesus, the Bible says that he set his face towards Jerusalem. I'm going to read it in a second. I'm going to catch them up to where it is. Thanks, baby. Um, so um, Luke chapter 9, uh, he sets his face towards Jerusalem. And um, in other words, he's going to the cross. It's time to head in the direction of the cross. And he wanted to go through the Samaria, the, some, through Samaria. The Bible specifically says that. So what Jesus does is he sends some people ahead to prepare the way because, let's face it, he drew big crowds. And they come back and they tell him, hey, hey, Jesus, Samaria is not happy. The Samaritans are not happy with you. It's dangerous. We can't go that way. And, um, and it's a long story why, but it's an awesome. Samaritans have a beautiful story as well. And um, two people, John and James, have this great idea. Keep in mind, John is Jesus' best friend. James is his brother. Brother, best friend, right? So uh, they say, hey, man, we got this good idea, Jesus. Let's show them. Let's show them. Let's call fire down from heaven. You remember in the Old Testament when, when uh, the prophets of Baal, Elijah, basically had a showdown and God won. Fire came down from heaven. took off. Man, He said, let's do it. Let's show these Samaritans who's boss. Let's show them who's God. Let's show them they can't mess with you. Jesus' response, tell somebody you curse too much. Verse 55, it says, but he turned and rebuked them. He rebuked his brother and best friend. 
His closest friend and his brother, it says, but he turned and rebuked them and said, you do not know what manner of spirit you are of. For the Son of Man did not come to destroy men's life, a.k.a. put everybody in their place, prove them wrong, tell them how you feel. He said he did not come to do that. It says the Son, he came to, read that with me, save them. And here's something that if you will apply these Few words, it'll change your life. And they went to another village. If you would start going around some battles that you need to quit fighting, especially with your mouth, your life would be a whole lot smoother. Your words. Because here's the thing. Jesus wasn't just disappointed with him. He was disgusted with him for a reason. For a reason. He was disgusted and disappointed. That's why he rebuked them. He didn't just say, hey, guys, go and sin no more. It said he rebuked them. He rebuked demons. He rebuked these boys. You know why? Because he was disappointed that they felt like they needed to go through them when they could go around them. But what do we do? Somebody, somebody provokes you or anything, you mess around, we want to go through everybody. And Jesus rebuked them because we, instead of going around them, they wanted to show themselves. They wanted to go right through them. See, your words tell on your heart. Your words diagnose your heart. You like to crap on people when you're bitter at people. And set boundaries all day. I'm telling y'all, I preach it all the time. If you've heard me preach... Once or a thousand, I preach on boundaries all the time. But setting boundaries and burning people down are two different things. And these just, uh, John and James, who I'm going to read some verses from them later because they learned their lesson. He said, man, why are you wanting to go through them when you can go around them? He was disappointed because he knew and he was telling them. He straight up told them. He straight up told him, y'all. He was like, you're not doing this teaching. You're not doing this for me. You're not doing this for the gospel. You're not doing this for my glory. You're doing this for you. You want to go through the Samaritans for you. It's about the Samaritans, not me. And he lit into them because you know what? Their words told on their heart. They had followed Jesus around to the point that it was time to go hang on the cross, but they still didn't get it. Still didn't get it. Man, I'm telling you, you set boundaries. People don't like boundaries, y'all. Don't expect setting boundaries to go smooth, but don't let it provoke you to try to burn people down. You're, you're, you don't even have a relationship with your parents because you're too busy, busy trying to prove them wrong. And Jesus was saying, no, I'm rebuking you now because you don't win doing things like this. You do not win doing things like that. And we're going to cut that off right now. We're going to nip that in the bud right now because if you boys go around trying to prove yourself, I promise you, the church will not make it. But we want to, we want to burn everybody down. Listen, ask yourself the question because like I told you, your words diagnose your heart. What's your goal? Because Jesus very clearly told them, your goal is the Samaritans, not me. What's your goal? Well, be honest. If you want to keep it 100, if you came here to actually grow, if you came here to hear what God has to speak to you, healing doesn't happen until you're honest. Healing doesn't happen until you decide not to hold back. No matter what people think, no matter how bad it hurts your feelings, ask yourself, what's your goals in life? What, what's your goals? Do you want your kids to get to the top? Because if you're honest with yourself, it will make you feel better about your failures by them succeeding. So you will make decisions that lack integrity and you will act out of character because your kids making it will make you feel better about your disappointment. Be honest with yourself because your words diagnose your heart your words diagnose your heart I mean you're always talking about your ex man it's been years now my ex oh my god they are a piece of work you don't say work <laughs> ain't nobody in here is Christian enough to say work and the fact is if you say you are then actually you miss the entire point because you talk about cussing not cursing you too busy trying not to cuss but you curse every day Man, I got, we got, we got, hey, you want to tell everybody, man, I am the mama and the daddy. I have done it their whole life. You tell everybody all the time. You criticize everybody and everything because your heart tells on you. You want to show them. You want to burn them down. You want to smear their face in it. You want to prove them wrong. Your words define your life and diagnose your heart. And Solomon said, life and death is in the power of the tongue and you will eat of its fruits. Those who love it will eat of its fruits. And Jesus said, guys, we are cutting this off now. I love you too much to not have this tough talk right now. 
cut it off. The fact that you were stalking people on social media trying to prove them wrong is your heart. It's a heart issue. And you don't find healing until you begin to be honest with where your heart is. And if you want to be honest with where your heart is, look at what's coming. Listen to what's coming out of your mouth. And be honest. Don't try to hide it. Don't try to defend it. Be honest about it. Y'all want some more? Y'all want some more? I hope so, because I know that at some point I hope y'all love me today, because I was nervous about this, and I haven't been nervous in a while. It, don't, it gets worse. It gets worse. Jesus, I've mentioned this story a few times randomly. Jesus heals Jairus, Jairus' daughter. Raises, actually, then raises her from the dead, right? Raises her from the dead. We missed the point of this story. Raises her from the dead. He gets to the party late. Matter of fact, you know, Jesus was the type. He did things in the process. He handled business all day, every day. He wasn't, his goal wasn't to get to the next miracle. His goal was the next step. That's why he was late to the party with Lazarus. And Lazarus had been dead four days. See, Jesus had peace. He trusted his father. So he was late to the party. That's a side note. That's free. He's late to the party. He's late to the party. He shows up. This girl's dead. Everybody's skeptical. Everybody's critical. They're talking crap. They're they're literally, and he raises her from the dead. But before he raises her from the dead, he clears the room of every negative person. Literally, nobody that was negative, nobody that was that was negative was in that room. They missed the one of the one of the best, the greatest miracle you can have a raising. They missed it. And if we, what we say in the Christian faith is we say that Jesus is our example, right? I mean, the Bible says that let the same mind that was in Christ be in you. Paul said be imitators of God. Jesus is our example, right? Jesus cleared the room of every pessimistic person so that he could accomplish a miracle. Okay, hear me now because I'm going deeper with this. Your words, your words aren't the only thing that define your life and diagnose your heart. The words you allow in your life will, def- de- will define your life and diagnose your heart. It's not just about what you speak. It's what you allow to be spoken over you. Look at Jesus. Jesus clears the room. You love Jesus, but your room is cluttered with a lot of things that are holding, cutting you off from what Jesus wants to do in your life. Jesus, the Son of God, Cut some things off before he raised this girl from the dead. And here's the thing. You love Jesus, but you miss out on miracles too because you won't clear your room. Listen to me now. Listen to me. You will not make room. If you don't clear your room, you don't make room for what God wants to do. I'm talking your heart, your life, your your marriage, your family. If you don't clear some room, God has no room to work because God will not force himself on you. God will not force room. He wants us to choose him because that's the way he truly loves us in a whole healthy love. Man. The reason it's so important to clear your room is because you will become what you let stay in your room. You will become it. You will become it. It's time for you... uh, You, you, you don't know why you keep why you stay on the outside looking in. It's because you won't clear your room. You don't have to make a show. You don't have to make a show about it, but you, there's some things in your life that need to go for God to really work. And you won't clear your room. Some of you, it's time to have a real conversation, some difficult ones, some ones that you may be terrified of. You've spent decades not having with your spouse, and you need to have some real conversations. And if, if those conversations aren't respected and received, then you need to talk about setting some boundaries. But all I know is you will become what you let stay in your room. Right. Toxic relationships will make you a toxic person. Amen. Period. Look at all the people, look at the culture we live in now and how many people we see change. It's not that they're bad people, it's they stay around bad influences for too long. And the same way that iron sharpens iron, the other is true. Crap creates crap. God, we live in a culture right now where everybody's shooting everybody down. You're willing to waste friendships, vomiting on social media, your opinions, like they really make a difference. They don't make a difference, but they do a lot of bad. The last couple of years, I've had people call me. I've had people call me and straight tell me, 
They call me and they say, I just don't understand why people are willing to, to, waste, to ruin a 15-year friendship over a Facebook post. And I'm like, several people, I'm like, look, I don't know why you're willing to post what you post in the spirit. You post it knowing it is going to provoke people that don't see it the way you see it. But that's what we do right now. Because your words define your life and diagnose your heart. That's what they do. That's what they do. Life and death is in the power of the tongue. King Solomon also said, he said, above all else, protect your heart. For out of it, your heart, flow the issues of life. So when Jesus said, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. What you need for healing in your life happens in your heart first. Happens in your heart, period. Your life isn't changing because your heart isn't changing and it starts right here. Bible says what a man believeth in his heart, so is he. I'm telling y'all, man, you spend it, you cut yourself down all the time. Listen to me, you cut yourself down all the time. You cut yourself down because you doubt yourself. And doubting yourself is a sin because it's doubting God, the one who made you. If he's an all-loving, perfect God and the Bible says he fearfully and wonderfully made us, then you're calling him a liar when you doubt yourself. Self-doubt and self-pity are not a good thing. I know you've been hurt, but the reason that you're constantly self-deprecation, cutting yourself down, constantly apologizing is a, is a coping mechanism because you live in shame, self-doubt. You don't believe in yourself. You don't believe you're good enough. You don't believe that God created you to do good things. It's a coping mechanism because you doubt yourself. And I'm, the, I'm telling you because I know that from experience, y'all. Most of my ministry, I stood on a stage and I would lift other people up by tearing myself down. And what I did is I reached a lot of people, but I had I invited other people to contribute. And just because I'm very thick skinned, you really don't get to you don't get Tourette's and learn to be awkward. You got to embrace it. It is what it is. And what I would do is I began to cut myself down so much, did a lot of good. Invited other people to take part in it, and it was, and I was okay with it. But here's the thing: just because I'm okay with it doesn't make it okay. It's not healthy to be the punchline of my every joke or other people's every joke because that is a product of self-deprecation. And you do that because in your heart you don't believe what God says about you. And King Solomon said, "What a man believeth in his heart, so is he." So you keep speaking negativity over your life. You keep letting other people speak it. You keep, even if it's joking all the time. I talk about my weaknesses, but the thing I do differently is I talk a lot more. About my strengths because I got a few, but I'm really good at them. I got some things that God gave me to work, and I work them, and I'm confident in them. That's the difference in my life now. I don't tell you about all my brokenness, I tell you about the blessing that God has done through it, and I tell you that I am in Him, I am more than a conqueror, and it changed. And if you keep speaking negativity and allowing people to speak negativity in your life, and you live in that and stay in that, the Bible says, What a man believes in his heart, so is he. You believe you're dumb, you speak you're dumb, you're gonna live dumb. You believe you're ugly, you're gonna be you you believe what your mom and daddy, what your grandmama told you, you believe what your employer or your high school teacher told you, and you're 50, 50 years old. Your life, you become what you believe. Yes, sir. That's right. And what you allow speak, what you allow to be spoken over you and what you speak over your life, your life will never live above that level. So you gotta change your heart, and it starts right here. Tell somebody, get your room right. Jesus cleared the room. Get your room right. Get your mouth right. Get your room right. Jesus wasn't playing, y'all. He got everybody out of the room that was. Everybody. See, we love to talk about what Jesus just did this. No, Jesus got everybody out of, and this isn't the only time that he did that type of thing. He cleared the room because he knew that the work of God started in him, and you're responsible for your own choices. Tell somebody, get your room right. Make room for God to work in your life, and there's no way to make room when your room is full of things that don't need to be there or unnecessary to what God wants to do in your life. It starts right here. Tell somebody, say it with me, actually. Your words define your life and diagnose your heart. 
And it's on you if you don't clear your room. It's not on your mama and daddy. You are 40 years old. Don't matter what they did or didn't do. It's on you. It's on you. You don't clear your room, it's on you. If you spend your life criticizing everybody else but not being accountable for anything, that's on you. Doesn't matter how your life started, it's on you where it's at now. The gospel's still good, but it's only good if you choose it. You spend your life avoiding or accusing people that challenge you all the time and you can't even get along with your spouse because you're constantly in a battle because you avoid them or accuse them when they try to challenge you because you can't even take criticism. Tell somebody, get your room right. Get your room right and it's on you if you don't. Man, the Bible very clearly, I love the NLT version, it says you will harvest what you plant. You reap what you sow. Life people will disappoint you. Life will disappoint you. Seasons will cripple you. You choose if you're going to clear the room and make some space for what God wants to do. I tell you one thing. Jesus did it, and he did it. He, he got whips. He cleared the doggone temple and said, it's the Bible says zeal for his house consumed him. That's in the Bible because he made room, and the gospel is we need to make room. And you harvest what you plant. You want to harvest? Don't cry about your harvest when you didn't plant anything. Because God loves you and he still loves you. I don't care if you're 97 or 7. You can do it. The gospel's still true. You harvest what you plant. Now this part that I'm about to go into, I want you to go ahead and confess this to me right now. Say, I love you, Ben. I love you. It's a sensitive subject. It's probably more sensitive than ever. And I literally on Thursday had made up my mind I wasn't talking about it. But then I looked at, I looked at my motives for not talking about it. I was like, ooh, what do you claim to be, Ben? Stop weaponizing politics in the Bible. You're like, where's he going in the Bible? I got you. Let me set it up and I'll get you right in the Bible. Stop it. Stop weaponizing politics in the Bible. Because you can make it whatever you want to make it. Just like you. I'll talk about that more next week. Like I said, next week, the next three weeks are going to be rough. So I'm going ahead for me, not for you, hopefully. You know how disappointing it's been to see so many claiming Christians talk about my rights, my rights, my rights, my rights, my rights, my rights, my choice, my choice, my choice, my rights, my rights, my rights, communism. Uh, I'm literally, do you want, if you claim to follow Jesus, your Christian responsibility supersedes your American rights. Free speech. I am so grateful as an American that I can say, I can preach the gospel right up here and not get arrested. I'm grateful. But saying what you want to say, when you want to say it, to who you want to say it, and saying hate, fe- hate speech is free speech, that is an American right. That is not a Christ-like lifestyle. And your God-given government rights are awesome, y'all. But Peter said, don't use your liberties for maliciousness. This is the man who Jesus said upon this rock, Peter, I will build my church and the gates of hell won't prevail against it. And he, Peter literally grew and he said, I, you do not use your liberties for maliciousness or manipulation. It's a hard thing. You don't just say what you want to say. And y'all been waiting for me to go to the Bible? Here we go. Make no mistake about it. Putting Jesus on the cross was a political move. Done in the name of God, but was based in fear and pride by people that refused to change. They were prideful and they wanted to kill Jesus to shut him up. Yet our Savior, our Savior was blessing the people that put him on the cross while he was dying on it. What's your heart look like? Because when I look at my heart, that's why I'm preaching this message. Make your choices. But if you make choices just for you, then don't really say you're committed to Jesus. Say, I'm not quite there yet. Because Jesus said, if you want to follow me, deny yourself, pick up your cross, and let's go. We live for other people, other mindedness. The Apostle Paul, you want, to, you want to read a Bible verse? The Apostle Paul said, consider others as better than yourself. That's Christ-like. 
And that's why the Bible says that God, Jesus was obedient, even death on a cross. He was obedient to God. That is the life that we're called to live if we truly want to love like Jesus. If you want to live for your own liberties, by all means, do your thing. But that is not what Jesus asked of us. Not what he offers. Religious people, self-righteous, stubborn people, we all did the same thing. We like to diagnose other people's dysfunction, but defend our own. Happened in the Bible. Matthew chapter 15. Jesus says this. This is for every side. This is not one side. This is for every side that becomes prideful and set in your ways. This is what words do in your life. Y'all ready? Tell somebody you curse too much. Matthew chapter 15. Jesus is talking to the religious, the ones that are set in their ways. They're biased. Every side of every issue does this. And so you cancel the word of God for the sake of your own tradition. You hypocrites. Jesus said, this is what got him put on the cross, y'all. He says, you hypocrites. Isaiah, talking about the Old Testament prophet, was right when he prophesied about you. For he wrote, these, pe- these people honor me with their... But their hearts are far from me. Their worship is a farce. For they teach man-made ideas as commands of God. We do it every day in our own lives. You can make the Bible whatever you want to make it. You can make it a weapon or you can make it something to change your life. The gospel is a choice. And he says, you guys, he says, you guys that are set in your ways and stubborn, he says, what you do is you try to make it what you want it to be so that you don't have to do what I've asked you to do. You try to make it look pretty. You try to talk about cussing. But you're messing around. Gossip is stronger in the church than any man. You will get less gossip at the bar than you'll get in most churches. You worship me with traditions of man. Your hearts are far from me. You cancel the you cancel the word of God for the sake of your own bias. Your own. We do it all the time. When we don't want to deal with something, we'll start talking about what somebody else needs to deal with. He continues, then Jesus called to the crowd. Listen, this is so awesome, y'all. May not, it doesn't feel good, but it's awesome. Then Jesus called to the crowd. Come and hear. Listen, he said, and try to understand. It's not what goes into your mouth that defiles you. You are defiled by the words that come out of your mouth. Your words define your life. And diagnose your heart. He said they were all trying to make it look pretty. I don't. I, I mean, back in high school, the Christians just say, "What'd you do this weekend?" I went to the club. Well, I don't do that. I'm saved. You try to make it look pretty. Everybody's wanting to be presentable and appropriate. Nobody wants to deal with the things, so they want to deal with other people's stuff instead of deal with their own. He says, basically, you have taken the word of God and you've made it whatever you need it to be, so that you don't have to do anything with it. And he said, if you really want to see it, it's not what goes into your mouth. It's what comes out. It will define your life and diagnose your heart, period. 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 Tell somebody you curse too much. You curse too much. You curse too much. Angie and I, y'all see our PDA. Got a lot of passion. Y'all know it. But what, you, what most of you don't see is our DRAMA. It's as passionate as passionate it gets. Boy, we scare the kids still. We, hey, we need to go back to the bedroom and the bathroom, the corner of the house where nobody hears us. We got it. Matter of fact, the tech team got a, just a small dose of it this morning. We kissed and made up, but <laughs> ministry is stressful. And there are seasons of ministry when you are a pastor or a, and a pastor's wife that you have to work through things privately because you can't talk about them publicly. And what we have discovered, because it's just not right to do, and so what we have discovered is, is that in those seasons we tend to project on each other a lot. We have the mindset of I'm doing the best I can, get off me with each other. And uh, we were given an analogy recently. It was beautiful. Uh, uh, he said we are playing tennis. We, we don't struggle with communication and conflict. We go right at each other. And in some seasons, it doesn't work as well as others, but it's a good quality. It's just got to manage it. This analogy said, y'all's defensiveness and the way you deflect is you play tennis. So let's quit calling it because when I say, you're deflected, Angie, it's a war. It's a war. <laughs> he said, you play tennis. What happens is in those seasons of ministry, what happens is you need to be, you get a ball, you get a ball served to you, and y'all were doing life together. And what you do is you just swing and you hit it back. You're playing tennis, and the thing about tennis is it's tiring. 
but you don't get anything done when you work through conflict like you play tennis. What happens is in those seasons, we're just constantly deflecting because we're tired, we're frustrated, we've got everything to work through because ministry is hard and, and heavy seasons of ministry are, and we're playing tennis, we're playing tennis, and we're getting nothing done. And here's the thing. We found out that didn't work for us especially, and we're still trying to learn what it looks like because we are passionate. That PDA has some disadvantages too, that passion. But what happens is that's what, the, that's what stubborn people do. That's how cursing defines your life. Right here, this is how your words define your life. What happens is you start just swinging because you don't want to deal with anything. This is what, this is what the Pharisees did. Somebody gives you some criticism. You're judging me. You don't know me. You're judging me. Uh, you don't know me. No, 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 no. I'm not. No, no, they're not judging you. They're just saying quit acting like a jerk. Quit taking that on me. Man, you don't appreciate what I do do. No, I appreciate what you do do. You're full of do do. You do a lot of. You do a lot of. You do a lot of good. The thing is, you you need to do some things better, and you need to quit doing a couple of things. But we swing. It's this young, entitled generation. This young, entitled generation. And before you know it, you're backhanded. Man, it's these young, entitled generation. No, it's these old boomers that need to either, either get, they need to get out of the way. These old, it's these racist Republicans, baby-killing Democrats. It's all this. The world's going to hell. The church sugarcoats the gospel. Everything. And you're tired and you're exhausted. So guess what happens? You end up doing exactly what the Pharisees did. They were so tired from playing tennis... That they killed the man that God sent to save them. And you think you know everything. You think that you are right in every situation and you were robbing yourself. You're killing what God sent in to save you. You're pushing people away. You're pushing opportunities away. And that's how your words define your life. And diagnose your heart. And the gospel is still there. You can do something with it. If you choose to. And Jesus wasn't the only one to teach this. I want to show you real quickly the men who listened to Jesus' tough talks and did something with them, some things they wrote in the New Testament. Y'all okay out there? You love me still? This is the Apostle Paul. He would take Jesus' tough talks seriously. Ephesians chapter 4. He says this, Don't use... Foul or abusive language. Let everything you say be good and helpful so that your words will be an encouragement to those who hear them. He is not at all talking about cussing right there. Matter of fact, if you read Ephesians 4 in context, he's actually talking about bitterness because it's the same chapter where he says, Be angry, but do not sin. Don't let the sun go down on your wrath. Does that sound like saying um, a cuss word? That sounds like being destructive and bitter. He goes next. I'm not going to read this verse. Ephesians chapter 5, he actually adds some things to talking. He talks about coarse joking, uh, sexual joking and greed. He's not saying that sex needs to be taboo in the church because right now it's very taboo. What he's saying is he uses the word in the Greek in Ephesians 5. I'm not going to read it. He uses the word pornea, which is a general sex sin. He's, ta- he's saying if your life is all about sex and that's your heart, you can have a lot of sex and be miserable. You can have a relationship that you have great sex and no substance, great chemistry and no compatibility. And he is using greed because those of you who worship your dreams, if you look in your heart, you worship your dreams, you're going to end up disappointed because you've got to worship the God of your dreams, not your dreams. Colossians 3, this is also Apostle Paul. But now is the time to get rid of anger, rage, malicious behavior, slander, and dirty language. We look at that dirty language. Anger, rage, malicious behavior. He's talking about destructive bitterness. We should be the most forgiving people on the planet. Yet we are throwing dirt on people to make ourselves feel better. We're trying to show everybody. And Paul is saying, get rid of it. Get rid of it. Cursing. Tell somebody you curse too much. James, brother of Jesus, the guy that he rebuked, right? Years later, he wrote the book of James, the brother of Jesus. He says this. With the tongue, we praise our Lord and Father, and with it we curse human beings who have been made in God's likeness. Out of the same mouth come praise and cursing. My brothers and sisters, read that with me. This should not be. James 1, he says it. If you claim to be religious but don't control your tongue, you were fooling yourself and your religion is, say it with me, worthless. 
And I'm about to set this thing on fire in your heart if you want it to set ablaze and find healing. Hey, we're in this together. This is not a beat down. This is a let's change our lives together. Let's grow together. Mm -hmm. Philippians, the book of Philippians, Paul's in prison. Paul was uh, persecuted in prison by church people. So he was worst season of his life. That's why he says a lot of times, he says, rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. In the worst season of his life, he was trusting God, not people. In Philippians chapter 3, I love this, y'all. He says, whatever happens, my dear brothers and sisters, whatever happens to me, rejoice in the Lord. I never get tired of telling you these things. I do it to safeguard your faith. Watch out for those dogs, those people who do evil, those mutilators who say you must be circumcised to be saved. He says, those people who put pressure on your back and expectations that God did not put on you. For we who worship by the Spirit of God are the ones who are truly circumcised. He says, your heart is what brings you close to Him. Your heart is where healing happens. Your heart is where God wants to change your life. We rely on Christ, what Christ Jesus has done for us. We put no confidence in human effort. Though I could have all, though, though I could have confidence in my own effort, if anyone could, y'all, he's about to get cocky for a reason. <laughs> if anyone could, I could. Indeed, if others have reason for confidence in their heart, I have even more confidence in their, in their own efforts. I have been, I have even more, excuse me. I was circumcised when I was eight days old. I'm a pure-blooded citizen of Israel. I'm a member of the tribe of Benjamin, a real Hebrew if there ever was one. I was a member of the Pharisees. who I was as strict and as conservative as they were. He says, I was a member of the Pharisees who demand the strictest obedience to the Jewish law. I was zealous. I was so zealous that I harshly persecuted the church. He killed the first Christian, the first martyr. And as for righteousness, I've obeyed the law without fault. He said, I did it all. He had a PhD, man. He did it all. He said, here it is. But what things were gained to me, those I counted for loss for Christ. And I'm going King Jimmy here. It's one of the few times you'll see me do it. Yea, doubtless. And I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord for whom I've suffered the loss of all things I didn't just gain them I lose, lost them and I do count them but say that with me Dumb. that I may win Christ and be found in him not having my own righteousness which is of the law but that which is through the faith of Christ the righteousness which is of God by faith listen to me this is going to blow your mind man Paul said I've gained it all I got it all I accomplished it all it meant nothing I lost everything. It meant nothing. And he says, I count it all as dung. Oh, we love talking about cussing, don't we? The Greek word for dung there is why I use KJV because every other Bible translation sh uh, uh, sugars it up. The word dung is the Greek word scubula, which is where later on in history the S-bomb would come. We like to just make it superficial, right? Paul said... Uh, I know I got I know y'all I know I can't make you confident and say the S bomb I don't want you to, but you can say scubula because you don't even know the language. So right now say it, say scubula. Scubula. Paul said I counted it scubula. Say it with me, it's scubula. My dysfunction, the things that I, the insecurities, the things in my life that are defining my life, that are messing me up, the boundaries I need to set, the decisions I need to make, the financial decisions I need to change, the things in my life I need to do. He said, it's all, Jesus is the answer and everything else is scupula. Say it with me, scupula. Man, Paul said it. Paul wrote it. You might as well be comfortable saying it. He said, scupula. So y'all are a little bit asleep right now. I'm about to say some things in your life and you're going to say it. Scoop you up with everything you got. You ready? You ready? Your pride. Your past. Your degrees. Your marriage. Your successes. Your failures. Your kids' successes. Your kids' failures. Every insecurity. Every setback. Every bad decision. Every good and perfect gift. God gave it to you. And, and Jesus is the answer. And Paul said, everything I've done, everything I've accomplished, it's all scuba compared to the love of Jesus. And that's what he went after. 
That's what he lost his head for. And that is the God that loves us. And if you believe him like I do, then you don't live for yourself. And you want to live less for yourself every single day. Scoop it up.